Thank you, Nigel. This is what we expected from you. This is always some fresh air coming in wherever you are. <laughs> so thank you for, for this. Um, I'm going to speak to German, um, and we have a translation for you. The floor is open. Wir haben jemanden von unserer Seite, der das Mikrofon führt. Wo ist das Mikrofon für Fragen? Das haben Sie. Sie mögen sich melden, das Mikrofon kommt zu Ihnen. Das Mikrofon bleibt immer in der Hand von uns und wird nicht aus der Hand gegeben. Das hat sich bewährt dafür, dass die Fragen mehr Fragen werden und weniger Co-Referate. Und dann gibt es Antworten. Bitte sehr. Uh, mein Name ist Axel Engler, guten Tag. Uh, ich habe eine Frage bezüglich uh, einem möglichen Wahlbetrug. Wir haben letztes Jahr gesehen, dass uh, millionenfach uh, in Amerika Trump um Stimmen betrogen wurde. Jetzt ging hier kürzlich durch die Presse, dass auch in Deutschland irgendwelche Hacker uh, die Bundestagswahl uh, eventuell beeinflussen uh, können, natürlich zum Nachteil sehr wahrscheinlich der AfD. Wie hoch schätzen Sie diese Gefahr ein und wenn sie bestehen würde, was uh, denken Sie, kann man dagegen tun? Sie fragen, jetzt, Sie, fra Sie fragen jetzt mich, ähm, die Gefahr besteht, dagegen rufen wir auf, gehen Sie um Viertel vor sechs wählen, bleiben Sie bis um sechs im Wahllokal, seien Sie selber Wahlbeobachter, beachten Sie, ob richtig ausgezählt wird oder nicht. Das ist der Aufruf, den wir machen können. No, that's a very good point. There is a wider point here that is very, very interesting. And it's called, and the term varies depending where you are. Some people call it postal voting, others call it early voting. Now, we used to have a system where if you were 98 years old or in a wheelchair or you worked abroad, you could apply to vote by post. And about two and a half percent of the electorate voted by post. Then Tony Blair said, oh, no, 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 we're going to extend that franchise. And now about 20% vote by post, and I understand in Germany the figure is very similar. Postal voting is open to massive fraud and to intimidation as well. And I know that in many of the Muslim communities in Britain, the women in those households, if they're signed up to postal votes, will be very lucky if they get to make the decision themselves. I know when postal votes are being delivered door to door, of knocks on the door and intimidation. And I tell you what, one of the lovely things about Europe is we can all learn things from each other. And the French do get some things right. Maybe not Macron, but they do get some things right. And the French have no postal voting. If you want to register a vote in France, you go down to the polling station on the Sunday of the election and you register that vote. And I think getting rid of early postal voting would reduce the elements of fraud, reduce the elements of intimidation. And anyway, what a farce it is if a fifth of the electorate vote two weeks before the final weekend debate. It makes no sense at all. I put it forward, I suggest it as a start. Not a solution to everything, but it would at least begin, would it not, to give us a fairer level playing field for everybody. Also, Nigel, a brilliant speech. You are great on YouTube, you are even better live. Thank you very much, and also a special thanks to Mrs. Schulich to bring you here. My question is, what's your comment on the decision of the European High Court to force Hungary and Slovakia uh, to settle uh, African and other migrants in, in, North, uh, in, in Northern Europe? Do you know something? Had the European Union stayed at, I don't know, 12, maybe 15 countries, uh, and had the Eurozone been restricted to Germany and the northern Benelux countries, I don't think the Union would face the crises that it does today. But the Union made two or three fundamental errors, all based 
on hubris, in my opinion. The first was to allow eight and then ten former communist countries to join the European Union before they were ready and before many of them had made the transition to full Western democracy. The second was to allow the Mediterranean to join the Eurozone despite the warnings of every sensible Dutch and German economist. But we now have an amazing situation where the continent is divided north to south by the Euro with the North beginning to feel quite resentful about their money being used to prop up bailout after bailout and the South looking at unemployment rates amongst their youth of 40 and 50 percent and wondering what's happened but now we have a cultural east-west split. The, the four countries that are really interesting, you mentioned Hungary sir, but the four countries that are really interesting are, well it's Hungary, it's Poland, it's the Czech Republic and it's Slovakia and recently a very well-known BBC commentator said he said when you listen to the Prime Ministers of those four countries talking about migration he said they make Nigel Farage sound like a Foreign Office diplomat <laughs> Th these are these countries have lived under oppression they've lived under communism they've they've craved if you like their own independence for all those years they are devout Roman Catholic countries with strong Christian values and for them it's a simple issue the issue is they are worried that a large rapid rise of Islamic immigration will not lead to integration it will lead to separation and division and they're having none of it and so the European Court this week rule you must do what Juncker says you must do what Merkel says and they're saying no we won't do it what do I think about it it's their sovereign right to make their own blooming minds up about who does or does not come into their countries and I admire Viktor Orban who I think at the moment is the strongest and best leader in the whole of Europe Mr. Farage, nice to see you. Äh, Dröse aus Leipzig, eine Frage an Sie. Die Menschen in Europa wollen eigentlich keine neue Sowjetunion. Wenn der Herr Juncker von Ihnen mehrfach schon erwähnt, eines Tages zur Besinnung kommt und das dann auch nicht mehr möchte und er bei Ihnen nach Rat fragt, was würden Sie Ihnen denn empfehlen? Well, my advice to Mr. Juncker would be, um, drink less at lunchtime. Um, <lacht> I mean, I, you know, I like a glass of wine, but there are limits, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Beatrix, I said I'd try and behave, but it's difficult. The, do you know something? I've been in that parliament 18 years, so, and I've been a group leader for 10 years, so I've got to know lots of the big bosses over the years, the Barrosos, the Van Rumpoys, he's not speaking to me at all, Van Rumpoy, but I've got to know lots of them over the years, and do you know something, in some ways, Juncker is by far the most interesting of all of them. Why do I say that? Because as Prime Minister of Luxembourg, which he was for nearly 20 years, don't doubt one thing, he did a brilliant job for the Luxembourg people. He might now talk about European rules and regulations and you must all do what we say. Didn't do it as boss of Luxembourg, did he? I mean, he's created this tax haven in the middle of Europe where cigarettes are almost free, petrol costs virtually nothing, and there's no tax. I mean, it's amazing what Juncker did. So, as a political operator, I admire him. But... And this, I think, folks, goes to the heart of something, 
which is perhaps a more difficult conversation in Germany. Juncker believes that the reason we had two world wars was because we had nation states in Europe and that therefore if we abolish nation states there'll be peace, love, happiness, <laughs> motherhood and apple pie and all the rest of it forever. And it is understandable why people in the 1950s should have looked for a way to make the world a better place. It's just that they've drawn the wrong conclusion. It is not the existence of nation state that leads to war. It is the absence or the breakdown of democracy in nation state that leads to these things happening. So Juncker, Juncker is stuck with a wildly outdated view of the world. And you know, it's very interesting this, and you try this, because I've tried this for 25 years, and no one yet has done me in on it. Give me one example. Just give me one example of a mature, functioning democracy going to war with another mature, functioning democracy democracy. It has never happened and it will never happen. And if we want Europe to be a happy and peaceful and successful place for our grandchildren and those that come after us, what we should be championing is not the artificiality of Brussels. It is proud, independent, democratic, functioning European states with their identities and their proud friendships with their neighbours. That's my Europe. Mr. Farage, uh, thank you very much for your great speech. I would like to ask a question concerning internal security. A few years ago, we have learned about the so-called Rotherham uh, scandal in the UK, which was already uh, um, incomplete information from our media because it was not, not only a Rotherham scandal, it was a whole Middle England scandal concerning also uh, Bristol, Telford, Aylesbury, Oxford, and many other Middle English uh, cities. My question is, do you think that such a thing is uh, also possible in Germany uh, under the conditions of this uh, immigration of Muslim young men? And uh, what could we do in order to avoid it? As we have no, um, as you correctly said, no um, balanced media and we have no Daily Mail in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well I have to say the Daily, Mail can be, the Daily Mail can be really good news unless they're writing about you as the individual, then it's a bit different. Um, the, well I think you've been through a similar experience, sir. Because am I not right in saying that two Christmas Eves ago, outside the train station in Cologne, one of the very stations where people stood that previous summer with signs. Do you remember those signs? Refugees welcome. Merkel is right. And wasn't it outside one of those very same stations where, you know, a mass sexual assaults took place on a, on a huge industrial scale? And wasn't that shut up by the German media and indeed the German police? Didn't it take days for the Western world to find out the truth? of what had happened in Cologne? Well, I'm sorry, folks, but I think it did. So we're seeing a bit of the same problem. The Rotherham, what happened in Rotherham, I mean, it's just on such a scale, it is difficult to believe. You know, Rotherham is not a particularly big northern town. It's a middle-sized northern town. And you're talking about 1,200 underage girls and 7,000 perpetrators. I mean, the sheer scale of this, you know, in a town with a population of 150,000, it's almost beyond belief. And what we've had there, and we've now had admissions. You know, one of the former MPs said, well, 
we didn't want to look too closely because we were scared of being thought to be racist. And it's rather like Beatrice's comment about bishops putting down their crosses and not being seen to be too overtly Christian. Um, I, I, what we need, what we need are leaders who are robust enough to stand up and to defend the Judeo-Christian culture upon which Western civilization was built. But please, but please, can I add something else that I think is very, very important? We know, we know that a lot has gone wrong within Islam over the last few years. We know a lot of the financing that has come out of a couple of Middle Eastern countries that has pushed certain agendas. You know, I mean, nobody, nobody in many of these Middle Eastern countries 20 years ago would you see a woman wearing a burqa. This is all quite recent stuff. Some very extreme strains of Islam have been planted out there. I will say this to all of you, and you can agree with me or disagree with me. But to confront Islamic terrorism, which is the biggest threat the world faces today, and to confront the division and the unhappiness in our cities and communities, I repeat, we have to be strong in standing up for who we are and what we are. But part of who we are and what we are means that we also believe in religious freedom and religious tolerance. And if we choose to go to war with the whole religion of Islam, we will lose. We will lose. And why? Because we have to recognize that actually there are lots and lots of people of an Islamic religion living in our countries who want their kids to play football with our kids, who want to get on in our society. We must take out the bad people. But if we demonize absolutely everybody, if we create martyrs within that, your genuine martyrs that are seen by the moderates, that somehow there's now a cultural war going on between the two religions, then we will lose. We have to be clever about how we approach this. We have to be strong and robust, but we have to do everything we can to get the good men and women who have an Islamic religion to be bolder and braver, as we have to be braver in standing up and condemning atrocities. Hello, Mr. Farage. Thanks for coming. Um, I had a question for you uh, regarding diversity. So basically, um, what we're seeing more and more is that all kind of left-wing, progressive so-called parties are pushing this idea of diversity. Um, the real diversity, however, that seems to be lacking in all of these parties is really the diversity of thought, especially in my generation. I'm somebody in the millennial generation. Uh, somebody who really sticks out. Um, I walk through my neighborhoods and I see the posters of the AfD ripped, torn apart. I see people, I've called the police on people in my generation who are defacing AfD posters and thinking it's the coolest thing. Uh, what do we do to really address that lack of intellectual diversity, that lack of diversity of thought, especially in the younger generations where basically what used to be the counterculture, leftist, um, progressive ideology, uh, the 60s and counterculture where now basically that's become the establishment and people in my generation really think that anything but being completely left-wing on all issues is hateful, bigoted and racist uh, regardless of whether you yourself are a member of so-called marginalized groups. Yeah, excellent point. Very well made. No, very, very well made. We, we have completely forgotten that tolerance is a two way street. We've forgotten that. I mean, gay marriage is a very good example in, in, in my country. So David Cameron was elected in 2010 without it being in the manifesto, not there. Stonewall, the leading gay charity in the United Kingdom, over 50 years old, were not campaigning for gay marriage. We'd had a system of civil partnerships which everybody thought was fair and respectful and decent. 
But David Cameron says, no, 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 no. I'm going to rush legislation through the House of Commons to enable gay marriage. He did it. Thereafter, anyone who said they weren't in favour of gay marriage was guilty of a hate crime. And that is how they change the agenda. And a two-way street, a tolerant society that believes, that believes in free speech, liberty and tolerance, respects the rights of gay people, but equally respects the rights of those for whom they don't particularly approve. That is how a tolerant two-way street works. How do we get there? Do you know something? I talked earlier about the huge battle we have against the establishment class, modern global corporatism. You know, the multinationals, the big selfish banks, big politics, big media, all of that. The educational establishment should be second on our list. And frankly, most of it needs to be torn down and we need to start again. Our universities across the West are poisoning the minds of young people by not teaching them objectively and fairly. Nigel Farage, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much to Beatrice also for the invitation. Fantastic talk. You know, I want to pick up on a lot of things that kind of come together in your talk, and that is, how is it possible to even confront Islam, uh, the lack of diversity of thought, European integration and opinions about the necessity for the EU, when the media, something you started with, right, uh, right uh, with your talk, the media is so difficult in Germany, how do you roll back the hate laws, the hate speech laws that have been enacted in Germany by Justice Minister Heiko Maas that make it illegal, illegal to question things like Islam, to say, I have a completely different opinion, which might be Christian, for example. How can hate speech regulations that have been brought in in Germany and at the European level be rolled back and does Germany need a First Amendment not like the United States so people here can be free to think and free to talk? Yes, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's more difficult in Germany than it was in the United Kingdom. And to get to where we got to was a hell of a battle. I'm not pretending this is easy, but you see, to do this, to really answer your question, it's a very short answer, actually. You need people to challenge this who are brave but you also need people to challenge this who are also wise and who realize how far they can push the argument up to the line without frankly being chucked in jail. And that is how you're going to have to do it here in Germany. And you're going to have to do it through, uh, you know, chiefly the internet. And then do you know what happens? What begins to happen is some of the local radio stations begin to think, do you know something? We've just done a survey. A majority of our listeners, we didn't realize. They actually believe in traditional values. And suddenly, they start to go in that direction because they start to get more listeners. And do you know what happens when they get more listeners? They get more advertising and they earn more money. And what I saw happen, you know, I saw sections of the media in the United Kingdom who 10 or 15 years ago painted me out as the devil who now think it's a jolly good thing we've left the European Union and we jolly well must control our borders and they've completely changed their opinion. In the end, slowly but surely, you can get the market to change this, but you need bold and wise leaders. And it's why I said earlier when I talked about Beatrix here in Berlin heading off to the Bundestag that while she's got a tremendous and fantastic opportunity, she also has a tremendous weight of responsibility on her shoulders. But I know her well enough to know that she's both bold and wise. Let's the question. Nigel, you correctly pointed out that uh, Brexit was noticeably absent from the debates. 
Something else that was noticeably absent for me as an American was the uh, Ukraine and Russia issue. I would uh, like to hear you speak about where you see Germany as uh, kind of this pivot point between Russia and the United States. Um, there are a lot of people in my country who would say that uh, Russia right now is one of the preeminent uh, threats to European security. So if you could speak to this a bit, I'd appreciate that. Uh, look, I think, you know, a, a, a proper debate on Russia takes hours. All I will say is this. Um, I wouldn't want to live in modern-day Russia. I certainly wouldn't want to be a journalist in modern-day Russia. But I think the way the West has attempted to demonize Putin is frankly ridiculous, almost verging on the childish. They hate Putin because he's a strong national leader. They don't believe in things like that. And I will add this. I think the attempt by the European Union and by NATO to extend to the east and to take the, and take, to take the Ukraine into their orbit was a very very stupid strategic mistake. If you poke the Russian bear with a stick, don't be surprised when a claw comes back and tries to have a go at you. All right? So, ein ganz großes Dankeschön an Nigel Farage. Vielen Dank, dass Sie gekommen sind und Gast gewesen sind. Ich glaube, wenn man jetzt noch viele Worte macht, dann kann man es nicht mehr besser machen. Deswegen will ich es wirklich kurz machen. Ich möchte mich sehr herzlich bedanken. Um, and I didn't know whether you drink alcohol or not. This is why I have a different present, which are cigars to say thank you. Thank you for coming, Nigel. Thank you. Applaus